Hi, I'm Old Norse Specialist Jackson Crawford, and the genesis of this video really owes in proximal cause something that my good friend Matthew T. Mossbrucker, who said, Crawford, you've got to engage more with the pop culture around your field. And I knew he was right when he said it, because people have asked me for opinions on movies and video games and TV shows about Vikings and Norse stuff for a long time. And I've been pretty reluctant to do it because I don't actually like, in general, movies or TV shows or video games very much, and specifically have a hard time liking those that touch on my academic subject, Norse myth, Vikings, etc. So I thought that I would start by trying a title that I actually have relatively good things to say about, and that is The Thirteenth Warrior, the 1999 movie starring Antonio Banderas and Omar Sharif, who I have heard quit acting after this movie debuted, uh, something about how terrible it was. I, I, I feel like he could have been more charitable to himself. Um, you know, this movie, after all, debuted after Mortal Kombat Annihilation, so we already knew how bad movies could be. And, uh, you know, if your scale is from Mortal Kombat Annihilation to Godfather, The Thirteenth Warrior is a lot closer to The Godfather than it is to Mortal Kombat Annihilation. Um, you know, but it's a... It's, it's, it's what, in my youth, I think we would call a popcorn movie, right? It's, a, it's an action movie that's got, you know, kind of a story to it. That's kind of clever in places. The acting's not terrible. I don't really know why he hated it. And personally, it's one of the Viking or Viking adjacent movies that I find most bearable. And in fact, it is my favorite film adaptation of Beowulf out of the 20 or 25 movie adaptations of Beowulf that exist. Well, let's see what I can do in going through some general points about this movie and some scenes and particulars that I think are worth noting. So a few general notes about the movie. Um, I don't really know what they were doing with the names. Uh, I know it's based on a Michael Crichton book, The Eaters of the Dead, so I assume the names come from there. Um, many of them are names that are bear a, a strong similarity to a name in Beowulf. So for example, uh, there's the quiet fella who's named Edgetho. That certainly is a lot like the name Edgetho in Beowulf. But it's not an Old Norse adaptation of that name. That name in Old Norse would be like Egthor. So it's not not like a consistent attempt to Norseify an Old English name. It seems more to be kind of an attempt to, I don't know, just distort a name enough that you might not notice that these are roughly the same names as in Beowulf. Not that the same characters necessarily have the same sort of roles as characters with similar names like the character named Wiglif in The Thirteenth Warrior is more like the character of Umferth and Beowulf, not like the character of uh, Wiglaf, etc. But, you know, I think these are kind of minor deals. I just don't understand what the principle behind the names was. It, that sort of confuses me. But whatever, it's not a big deal. As far as the look of stuff and people, I am not an archaeologist, as I've said a hundred thousand times in different ways. I don't obsess about ships and weapons and armor and clothes and hairstyles and god forbid I mention it on the internet beard styles. So I don't really care about that stuff. Yes, you can see that a lot of the armor is anachronistic, but I don't know. That's not the kind of thing that ever sticks in my craw very much. Um, I actually think that it's a point in the movie's favor that you have a variety of uh, hair colors, hairstyles, facial hairstyles, right? Even the main Viking character, Bruvaif, the sort of Beowulf takeoff, uh, is clean-shaven. I mean, you'd be hard-pressed to find a clean-shaven Viking character in 2010s or, or 2020s uh, Viking fiction. Uh, 
or people just have this fetishization of, of these huge beards on Viking characters. Another aspect of that is tattoos. Only one character has tattoos. The guy who, I guess, was speaking Swedish, uh, has the kind of band of tattoos across his face. Um, it's different. It's not the heavy tattooed uh, Viking stereotype that's come to dominate in the 2010s and 2020s uh, from like the Vikings TV show. Uh, I, I appreciate that. I don't like the tattoos on, on those shows. There's not a lot of reason to think that Vikings were heavily tattooed. In fact, the single source that I can think of for Vikings being tattooed is Ahmed ibn Fadlan uh, and his account of his journey in which he met these Vikings uh, where he said that they were, were tattooed. So that's interesting that actually it's here we have an interpretation of that very source and we don't see a lot of tattoos. As to the relationship of this work, this movie, um, with with Ahmed ibn Fadlan's account of meeting the Rus in uh, the area of what's now Kazan, Russia, and I think the winter of 922, 923, uh, I've done a video where I talked about this account and uh, give a lot more detail there. I also strongly recommend the new translation in Ibn Fadlan and the Land of Darkness. Uh, that's by Lundy and Stone. Uh, it's easily available wherever books are sold. Very good, uh, accessible English translation with some great notes and also some some other medieval Arabic travelogues, which are pretty interesting. I think Arabic and Persian travelogues. Um, you know, we see this uh, this Viking funeral early on in the movie. So that starts at what, like 606 or so. It's based on on Ibn Fadlan's account. Of course, the character of Ahmed Ibn Fadlan, played by Antonio Banderas, based on, on that traveler. Um, actually, the, uh, the version of the funeral in the movie is not as detailed as in uh, Ibn Fadlan's account, where he details a lot more uh, animal sacrifices. And we also see some change in the roles of, of people. So for example, we see the angel of death, kind of a vulva or prophetess figure she appears at about 1042. Uh, in Ibn Fadlan's actual account, she is the, uh, the old woman, the witch, who stabs to death the young woman who was sacrificed to go with the chieftain uh, who's died. Now, probably the most famous aspect of this funeral is used in this movie is the chant of the slave woman as she is sacrificed. Lo, there do I see my father, etc. That has become kind of memetically altered and adapted to all kinds of Viking loving circumstances on the internet now. I don't think a lot of people even realize that it's from this movie. It is close-ish to what uh, Ibn Fadlan says the, the slave woman said in his account. Um, the main difference is at the end where she specifically mentions Valhalla, where the brave will live forever. In the original um, I mean, of course, I, I actually can't read the, the Arabic, but Lundy and Stone translate the original as her saying paradise. Um, who knows what exactly this woman said in the original language she was speaking. Hard to know if she was even speaking Old Norse. Perhaps she was speaking, say, a Slavic language instead. Um, somehow this was interpreted by someone to Ibn Fadlan who wrote down, apparently, uh, paradise is the Arabic translation. It's hard to think of all whole as much of a paradise, but perhaps... She was saying something like that. Um, I offer in my earlier video from a few years ago about Ibn Fadlan and his account uh, what this chant might have sounded like in Old Norse, uh, if it was in Old Norse originally. So you can check out that video if you want. But I find that when I mention videos and other videos, it tends that this, this video still might, might as well never have existed. Anyway, uh, there's some other details early on in the movie that are kind of neat. Uh, or that mystify me, alternately. Um, at about 5.30, so actually before the funeral, uh, Bullwife asks uh, Ibn Fadlan for a song of glory, and he starts to recite uh, Genesis. That's kind of fun, because actually around line 180 of Beowulf, uh, one of the first of many digressions in that uh, poem is actually a, a show for old English poet singing the uh, story of Genesis. There's the stuff about mist early on, about them not being sure who someone is or if he's real, uh, if he appears in the mist. I don't really know where that comes from. Uh, at about 8.45, uh, 
it is kind of fun the detail where they're passing around the bowl and they all wash their faces and then blow their noses on them and then pass it on and Ibn Fadlan shows this intense disgust for it that's a real detail from Ibn Fadlan's account and uh, he, the, and the disgust is genuine to his his account. Uh, it's worth noting uh, because people get on their you know their <laughs> their white horses and want to charge into the defense of the Vikings when this sort of stuff comes up on the internet. Ibn Fadlan was not uniformly disgusted by the Vikings and actually had some positive things to say about them. For one thing, one of the funniest things about his account is that as you read him encountering all these different people in the story of his journey. Uh, he has a lot of opinions about how ugly everyone to the north is, but then he doesn't think that about the Vikings. He thinks the Vikings are, are, are nice looking. So it's a funny little detail. Uh, let me give you a quick word from my sponsor in the usual way, and I'll come back and walk you through some more of my thoughts on the 13th Warrior. Another fun thing about the early parts of the movie is that the actors are speaking uh, modern Norwegian, Swedish, or Danish. I'm pretty sure I heard all three in the uh, untranslated dialogue. Um, this is actually kind of a nice bilingual bonus, as Stevie Tropes would call it, uh, because it gives the sense of this being, for some reason, a kind of pan-Scandinavian uh, affair. Um, you know, and with, with, all, with these different dialects and such. I don't know that that's actually necessarily realistic. I would think that the Rus that even Fadlan encountered would be basically Swedes, but it's a neat little detail. All right. Now we get into the journey from the encampment near Kazan up to Scandinavia. And now by that point, we are leaving the actual account of Ibn Fadlan, the whole thing about, um, you know, him becoming the 13th warrior. And, and, and also, by the way, the 13 months in the year uh, justification for the 13 warriors I'm unfamiliar with. We actually are not that clear about what the Norse calendar was like in pre-Christian times. Uh, what we do know, uh, yes, the, 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 there's lunar months, but I don't recall there being 13 named months. Uh, maybe there are. I'll have to check my own old video about the Norse calendar. But this doesn't seem to have been a really significant part of the culture at any rate. Uh, they talk about dates and months and calendrical things uh, very little. I do like the line at about 1430, hurry to meet death before your place is taken. Strikes me as a very Norse kind of notion. And then we have the famous uh, campfire scenes where Ibn Fadlan is listening to the Scandinavians talking and he slowly learns to speak like them. I like the part around 1650 or so where the conversation starts being sort of mixed Scandinavian English. Do not foretell me why, right? Foretell being uh, like like Norwegian fortella, right? To, to, to tell. Um, I, I kind of like the mixed English Scandinavian that comes up there. Um, by the time that he's learned to speak Scandinavian and Bulvife approaches uh, Ibn Fadlan and asks him at around 1825 if he can draw sounds and Ibn Fadlan writes out um, the confession of faith in Arabic and the sand. Um, I, you know, this is a pretty forced scene for me. The Vikings were well aware of writing uh, and engaged in writing themselves in the younger Fudark runes at this time, so that's not very uh, believable. At around 2126, when they're reaching the shore of Scandinavia, uh, they shout out Odin, and I don't know why. Not quite sure why you just shout out uh, Odin there. But they meet the Coast Guard, who takes them to the Hall of Hrothgar. Uh, and again, here we have a name that's not Norsified, because actually the Norse name does occur in the saga of Hrothkraki and his champions, recently translated by me in Two Sagas of Mythical Heroes, now out from Hackett Publishing. The Norse form of Hrothgar is Hroar, um, but again, there's no attempt to actually make that the real Norse name. Uh, you might notice when Bulvaif meets Hrothgar at about 2546, it is a lot like the scene in the Two Towers where uh, Gandalf and company meet Theoden. That's because they're based on the same scene 
in Beowulf. I, you know, I, I struggle a little bit with the scenes around where they're meeting the uh, Vendel, these marauding Neanderthal uh, uh, types. Uh, this is all around, starting around uh, 2850 or so in the movie. Um, there's some kind of ancillary things here that I struggle with. For one thing, I'm a bird guy and I hear all these North American birds in the forest, right? There's a lot of chickadees <laughs> uh, in particular. That ticks me out of it a little bit, but I know that as a bird guy, I'm in a distinct minority in a cat-loving world. I also don't know why the houses that they, uh, they first see the Vendel attack in look like indoor tree houses. I don't know what the deal is at around 3124 with how the Vendel seemed to worship like a Venus statuette from the Stone Age. I don't know if those were ever found in Scandinavia. I don't think so. But they go back to the hall and around 30, minute 34 is uh, actually uh, one of my favorite things about the movie and it has been since I would have seen it in theaters at 14 or 15 with my friend Richard, and, you know, in the middle school, early high school, which is that um, the unfair like character, uh, Wiglif, the king's son, says to Bullvive something about how, you know, something, something was just luck. And Bullvive says, luck often enough will save a man if his courage holds. It's an excellent translation of the line, weird oft nereth und fechne er thone his elendech from Beowulf. Um, I've never seen a better translation of that line, even in my favorite translation of Beowulf by Dick Ringler, also available from Agate Publishing Company. Um, I, I really like that this movie doesn't call itself Beowulf because that kind of detail coming straight out of the original, um, being done in an understated way, really gratifies me as a, a Beowulf fan without making me nitpick the things that otherwise are not very much like Beowulf. Um, I also think that as far as portraying the character of Beowulf, that Burweif, um is admirably understated in his portrayal. Um, that strikes me as a lot like the actual character of Beowulf in the poem, who uses a lot of light at ease, right? He's, he's, he understates things, he doesn't boast. Um, or, or he boasts in a subtle way. I actually really like his portrayal of the character. We get some more good lines around 3650. The, uh, the Scandinavian who mostly talks to Ibn Fadlan, I don't know if I ever picked up most of these guys' names, um, says, well, the old father wove the skein of your life a long time ago. Uh, your fate is fixed. You won't live one instant longer than you're destined to something along these lines. Uh, the Old Father seems like a pretty clear reference to Odin, for example, in Kinnings. One of his names is Alden Gauter, uh, the aged Gauter, progenitor. Um, however, the notion that Odin would actually be the one weaving anything is foreign to uh, real Norse mythology. For one thing, the beings who determine fate are the Norns. Uh, They're female goddess-like beings. And they don't weave fate, but rather carve it, if we read Bolas Ball. Uh, the weaving seems to be a Greek-influenced image that you also see in a lot of internet discussions um, centered on Norse mythology, uh, based on, on the uh, Greek moray. Um, it's also weird to think of Odin weaving anything. In a uh, hyper-masculine society like the Norse, you have well-defined gender roles, and men weaving would be very, very unusual. So that's that's a pretty foreign cultural idea. Uh, otherwise, though, the sense of what he's saying is quite Norse, right? It reminds me of um, Skirner's uh, statement of, of, of resolution, um, of his courage in the poem for Skirner, for Skirner's, for Skirner's poem, uh, which I've discussed elsewhere. Very, very Norse in, in conception, even if the details are, are pretty off. Then, you know, the rest of the movie I find there's not as much to say about. Uh, the arm that, or like bear claw that is pulled, bear paw that is pulled off of one of the attacking Neanderthal types at about 4150 seems like a pretty clear 
Shout out to Beowulf. At about 4740, there is the Holmganga, or duel, that is fought with three shields, where the uh, opponents are trying to destroy the three shields of uh, their enemy in the duel. That is uh, not part of Beowulf, but is a very saga uh, e event. This, this, these three shield duels are, are quite common there. We even have kind of a nod to the concept of Weirgild at about 5025, where the uh, winning party, who is won by, you know, an underhanded trick, uh, pays for the uh, man that he's killed to his friends. I realize there's spoilers in this. Spoiler alert for the rest of this, because I'm now kind of into the, toward the end of the movie. Um, I think it's interesting that at about 50, uh, about minute 59, we have these Neanderthal beings attacking in their bare garments. And it occurred to me, that, you know, the Berserker is, for the large part, um, a nimical figure, a bad guy, an antagonist in the sagas. And these guys are literally wearing bear shirts. <laughs> and they're bad guys, and they're kind of Berserk. So I wondered if that was kind of a, an interesting shout out to the concept of a Berserker, but actually turned much more negative than I think it typically is in 2010s, 2020s media. One of my favorite little details is that one, about 111 in the movie, we actually hear the Neanderthals talking. I'm not going to tell his story for him because how this came to be is a great story, but that is Tom Dubois of the faculty of the University of Wisconsin Scandinavian then department speaking Finnish into a telephone. <laughs> and I, I love that it is Finnish meant to sound scary. Um, one day I've got to have him on the channel and tell the story of how uh, that came to be. But it's it's a, a really, really funny story. Way funnier than, than I could tell for him without feeling like I was stealing his, his thunder. Um, we have the swimming at about 114, about 123 too. Of course, Beowulf swims down into Grendel's mother's lair in, uh, in Beowulf. So that's a neat shout out to that. Um, you know, and then I don't know what else to say beyond uh, at about 131, we get that reprise of Lo, there do I see my father, where the Vikings preparing for their last battle against the uh, Neanderthals or the Vendel uh, begin to say uh, chant based on the slave woman's chant from Ibn Fadlan's account or from much earlier in the movie. I think it's a little odd, uh, you know, to think that whatever whatever belief system the slave woman had whether she was Norse or Slavic or, or some other um, from some other culture or belief system uh, would be transferred to these Vikings themselves I think is tenuous but um, obviously it strikes a chord with a lot of people it's become uh, again very memetically stretched on the internet people I think think that it's a legit Viking prayer it is based on something that comes from a source that is probably talking about uh, a Norse or perhaps Old Slavic original, but I think that it doesn't really belong in the context that we see it here. Nonetheless, the story of the movie makes it work, and uh, clearly it strikes a chord with a lot of people. So if you want to see what it might have looked like in, in Old Norse, uh, check out my much earlier video about Ibn Fadlan and his account. Well, you know, I'm not Rift Tracks, and I'm not uh, a cinema critic, obviously, but I hope some of these thoughts were worthwhile for you. I would give the 13th Warrior, I mean, it, it, <laughs> you know, if we take 0 as Mortal Kombat Annihilation and 10 as The Godfather, uh, I think that would make most movies 9s. Uh, if we take a simpler, you know, old-fashioned TV guide, 1 to 4 stars, rating system I'd probably give this a three out of four right it's not perfect but it's entertaining it's a good popcorn movie um, it is definitely uh, an artifact of its own time in terms of when it was made I mean it's hard to imagine a Muslim protagonist being portrayed this positively in the years after 2001 and it's hard to imagine 
the media sitting still for Antonio Banderas portraying a Muslim protagonist after like 2015. So I think this movie kind of had to be made when it was made. And, you know, there's a lot you can take issue with, but it's not this god-awful piece of dreck that I think Omar Sharif felt like it was. Uh, and for me, maybe because it precedes this period in the 2010s when all the stuff started to get so much more fetishized, which I think probably draws its beginning from from the huge cultural impact of the Peter Jackson Lord of the Rings movies. I think it stands as a a more independent Viking movie with a more neutral um, you know they're not a more neutral portrayal of the Vikings where they're not drinking from skulls and they're also not these you know idealized figures that I think the Vikings TV show seems to make of them I don't know I've never seen the Vikings TV show or, um, someone's probably going to hold a knife to my throat before I ever do alright well thank you Patreon for your continued support in spite of rambling videos like this and from beautiful Colorado. Let me wish all of you all the very best.